I'm going to set the scene by talking about why this is a significant moment for you to change your business model and really why post COVID there isn't another way forward that's going to end up with you having a viable, sustainable business. I do think we are on the cusp of something very, very exciting. And we're probably on the cusp of the end of capitalism as we have known it. So a brief history of capitalism, and this normally takes half an hour. I'm going to try and do it in, in five minutes. <laughs> um, there's more people coming in, Rosé, just to let you know. So what has happened since the 1700s? Um, the, in, in very, very kind of brief terms, commoditization. And in my view, and I have checked this out with a couple of economists and some other people more clever than me, three things really have been commoditized by capitalism. People, land or the planet, and money itself. I don't know if anyone saw the Samuel L. Jackson programs on slavery recently if you haven't do download it on iplayer i know a bit about the slave industry but i i found myself crying during all of the four episodes it's absolutely starting startlingly shocking of what humans have done to humans it, and this was business folks this was this was business these these were business people running the slave trade 12 million people moved from africa to the americas two million of whom died on the way there, by the way, in shipwrecks. But these were, these were business people of the day, good people, many of whom went to church, can you believe, at the same time as trading slaves. And that got me thinking about how much of we, what we have considered is normal in terms of doing business and capitalism is as bad as the slave trade was in different ways. I mean, how how good is it that I used to live near one of the most polluted, in, in the most polluted area of London, South East London, near a busy main road, that was killing people. It was killing children who lived in that area. And yet we thought that was normal. Obviously things have moved on in, in the last 20, 30 years since I've been there and, and uh, that level of pollution is now reducing. But there's a number of things we've taken as normal cultural norms that actually are not good things at all and a lot of what has been done in the name of capitalism is actually evil to use a to use a strong word we've it's all starting in the industrial revolution before which most business was was artisan and small scale Again, I haven't got time to talk about it and I could go on for ages about this, but you had the Enclosure Act of 1773, forced a lot of people off the land from running in effect their own businesses, forced them into cities. Just at the same time, the weaving process was becoming automated. And I have to take some responsibility for that as one of my ancestors created the spinning jenny, which helped automate the weaving process along with a couple of other inventions. James Hargreaves, he was called, described as a stout broad man of around five foot 10 or rather more. So obviously some of the genes ran, ran down the family. Um, but the industrial revolution was a, a step change in terms of how business became. And around that time, of course, the well-known quote from Adam Smith, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but regard to their own self-interest. In other words, everyone was out for themselves. Business was about making things better for yourself and who cares about other people? Well, Adam Smith wasn't actually as extreme as it became later on, which I'll show you in a minute. He did later on in The Wealth of Nations talk about why it was important for businesses to pay their taxes in order to pay for the infrastructure of society and the community. And unfortunately, in the following 200 years, capitalism became more and more extreme. So in 1970, 
we have this quote from Milton Friedman, there is one and only one social responsibility of business to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits. The 1970s, philosophy wise, and probably the 1980s in terms of practice, is the point at which capitalism took a distinct turn for the worse. And the last 50 years, we have seen this extreme version of capitalism that is why the world is in such a mess now. I mean, a well-known quote from Maggie Thatcher in 1987, there is no such thing as society. There are individual men and women, and there are families. I don't know who agrees with that, but most people I know don't. So 1970s and 80s, we have this extreme version of capitalism. The market controls everything. Uh, the philosophy was you can't, you can't, the market has to be the thing that controls everything. Forget the commons, the things we share, forget the value put into society by caring professions, people bringing up children, etc. And what's happened since? Well, 2008, of course, we had the financial crisis. So we have our three pillars of capitalism, the commoditization of people, probably in that order. People came first, then land, then money. One of those three, money, broke down. Now, I think, and I know others who agree with me on this, that there was a huge opportunity in 2008 to change the way we do capitalism, the way we do business massive opportunity it was very very clear that it was built on sand a lot of the finance industry is built on debt there's not people in the finance industry a lot of them aren't contributing to the economy they're basically gambling they're lending money that they haven't got i mean that's pretty in a nutshell what happened in 2008 creating a run on the banks had to be bailed out. There was a tremendous opportunity in 2008 to press the reset button and to start again and to do it in a better way that's better for people and better for planet. So money, the pillar of capitalism was broken down in 2008. And what's happened since then? Well, now this data this is from two or three years ago, 42 people holding half the wealth of the global population. Are we happy about that? The parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, 415 is what it reached last year. It's slightly gone down this year with the pandemic, but not very much. And the start of the Industrial Revolution in 1760, there were 280 parts per million of carbon. That's what we've done in the last 250 years. And only 19% of millennials uh, or younger consider the Zamos capitalists. I do think that's probably a lot lower now. A powerful image, which many of you might have seen before. This is my um, impression of what business has been doing in the last 50 years, playing golf while the world burns around it. We had a powerful movement in, well, it's going along before 2019, but the realization of what we're doing to the planet Hit, um, hit us in 2019 and started to make a much bigger impact. And that's the second pillar of capitalism gone. We can't continue taking from the planet without giving back. We can't continue to steal from natural resources in the way that we have been doing. Even the Financial Times in 2019, the bastion of capitalism had this as their front cover capitalism time for a reset. So if they're saying that, then actually it must be true as they are the, the holder, if you like, in journalism terms of our current system. What's happened in 2020? Well, I believe that the third um, pillar of the commoditization that capitalism pr produce has been broken down. There's been a realization that we can't keep treating people as we have done as businesses. There was a realization that key workers are getting paid far less
than they're worth, the delivery drivers, the nurses, the care home workers, even supermarket workers, many of whom are paid in a year what the CEO, CEOs of those companies, Sainsbury's, Tesco's, are paid in a day. Are we happy about that? I'm not, because it's wrong. And of course, we've had the Black Lives Matter movement, which again, in the nations that were heavily involved in the slave trade, guess what? 250 years later, there is discrimination and persecution of minorities. Business has been responsible for that. Business has been responsible for plundering the planet and business has been responsible for making a, a mockery of the financial systems. So do we want to get back to normal? I don't. This was on the side of a Spanish building right at the beginning of the pandemic. We will not get back to normal because normal was the problem. I don't want to go back to normal because it was pretty crap, to be honest with you. It wasn't working. It's not working for the majority of the population. Taking back control was a slogan used in the Brexit campaign. Well, actually, maybe we need to take back control of our own systems, of our own communities, of our own businesses that are increasing inequality and are destroying the planet. So what do we need to do? And how long have I got left, Rosé? For a minute. OK, right. Very, very briefly, what is a B Corp? They're companies that have changed their articles and legally put in their, into their business that they're there for people and planet, all stakeholders, not just profit. They go through a rigorous certification and Duncan's gonna talk more about this later in five areas, governance, workers, community, environment, and customers. I've written a book on this, which I'll mention at the end. We recertify every three years and the bar gets higher each time. So being a B Corp forces you to become better and better and better as time goes on. And finally, we produce an impact report every year saying, this is what we've done for the planet. We know we're not perfect. We haven't got it all right, but here's a few things that shows progress. Impact report, if you want Cotswold Fairs, we're happy to send it out. However, though, it's, it's more than that. I, I do think this is a B Corp seminar, but I do think that actually being a B Corp isn't enough. It's not a case of ticking some boxes and getting slightly better. I do think that we need a transformational change. We don't just want to be better than our competitors down the road. We need to change as people and we need businesses that are making a fa fun fundamental difference in some of those SDG goals. And we're fortunate today to have two businesses that are doing just that. We've got one, the Tony's Chocolate Lonely, that has a stated aim of eliminating child slavery in cocoa plantations. And we have Duncan's business, who's on in a, in a minute, to, who, who has a, a clear stated aim of eliminating water poverty. We need businesses that aren't just incrementally changing stuff. We need businesses that are transformational and radically different. Otherwise, we will have businesses that are continuing to kill people like these people in Bangladesh, washed out of their home. And we need to get emotional about this stuff. It's not just a, a head thing. It's not just, oh, yes, we ought to because that's the right thing to do. We should be getting passionate. We should be getting emotional. We should be creating businesses that are going to make people's lives better and are going to recover the planet back in some way to, to what it was 50 years ago. So that's me done. Uh, there is an offer. I'm happy to send a copy of my book, Forces for Good, to the first five people that email me after 12 o'clock today after this, uh, no, where are we? One o'clock today after this meeting is finished and I will hand over to Rosé again now and, and share my screen. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for laying out um, this stark reality. And um, 
articulating and helping us understand why now is such a critical um, time um, point in time. Um, next, we will hear from Duncan. Um, Duncan founded and now leads um, the ethical water brand called One. And One has so far donated 25 million pounds to fund clean water projects and impacted over 4 million people. Um, and all of this while being a tiny company and working as part of a small team. So I'm very excited to hand over to Duncan now to share the journey of One. Thank you, Thank you Rosé. Uh, um, Duncan, we can see your browser, not your slides. Ah, okay. Let's try and change that then. Why is that not working? Can you see that? Yeah, we just you just need to swap this place. Yeah. There you go. Sorry Thank about you. that. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Duncan Goose. I'm the founder of One Water. Uh, I'd like to say a big hello to Rob Amar. Long time no see, Rob. Hope you're keeping well. Um, and thank you to Paul and to Rosé for inviting me to come and speak today. Um, before I start, I don't know if anybody had the chance to listen to Mark Carney uh, give the wreath lecture on uh, Radio 4 at nine o'clock this morning. Um, but if you didn't manage to get to listen to that, I, I suggest you you have a, a good listen to it because it picks up on some of the Paul's uh, the points that Paul made, um, not least that they were about three hours away from absolute global disaster. Um, so it kind of shows you how far you, you can actually push things. Um, just uh, I want to talk a little bit about one and give you some context. Um, and it's an odd thing because uh, bottled water at the moment is public enemy number one. And, uh, but I'd like to take you on a bit of a journey about what we've been doing really since we started. And I think the first thing to say is that um, the mission of One was always to try and do the best that we possibly could with the market that we operated in uh, to begin with. So uh, is this the right way around, Rosa? Are you seeing just the screen or are you seeing all the other slides as well? This is the right way around. We can just it's see right. um, okay. your first slide. That's fine, thanks. Um, so when we set out, we really had a very clear vision, which is to try and give everybody globally access to safe, clean water. Um, and that was that was the stated mission when we started. Um, and that's really what we've been doing since 2005. Um, we've added to that over the last few years, and that's really taking in a, a, a more of an environmental um, stance, which is to say we actually want to live in a low carbon world and we want to be free from plastic pollution. Um, that's not bandwagon jumping, but actually has been part of our MO really since the sort of very beginning. Um, so I don't know if you can see this, but this was, um, we were doing refillable bottles uh, back in 2005. Um, and over time they've, they've evolved and changed, but even though we were a bottled water company, we would already have that as part of our mission. A um, couple of things about, you know, brand trends um, that you'll see through a lot of data that you, you you get through research materials and stuff like that, saying that people are willing to pay more, they're more interested in people that take care of the planet. Um, they're really looking for purchase driven, uh, for purpose driven brands and looking for brands that will drive societal and environmental changes. And I'm sure probably everybody on this presentation today is using facts like this in, in their presentations. I think there is a bit of what consumers say and what consumers do are two slightly different things. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't embed these kind of practices within your own organization as, as much as you possibly can. And that will kind of lead us into, into the world of B Corp. Um, so when we first started out, we had two products. Uh, we had water in, in PET bottles and we had water in, in glass bottles. And that's where we started out. And we had a very simple model, which was to give away all of the profits that we made to funding water projects in, in developing countries. And as Rosé was saying, um, you know, that's now taken us to having given away 25 million and changing over 4 million people's lives. Um, so we're really proud of that achievement. That was what we set out to do. And, and we've continued to do that. The thing that most people wouldn't know about us is that we actually started using recycled plastic in our bottles over a decade ago. So we were paying a premium of between three to four hundred pounds a ton on top of the normal costs that we were paying just to have a, a recycled component in there. Um, we didn't talk about it. We just wanted to maintain that sort of focus on, on trying to uh, give away 
money to fund clean water projects. But in from an environmental stance, it was really important to me that we did the best that we possibly could. Um, that percentage has increased over time. So it went from 25 to 50, and we're now looking at 100% on some of the ranges that we do. We've also lightweighted the bottles, so there's less plastic in it, using less energy, changed the caps, changed the neck finish on it. So we've tried to improve it as much as we possibly can. Um, same thing with glass. Um, it's made of 34% uh, uh, recycled glass. Um, and it's been lightweighted as well. So even though it's generating this money for these water projects, environmentally, we've, we've tried to do the best that we possibly can. Um, I put this slide up, not as, a, as a, a bashing anybody else, but just to show that you can operate in the same area as lots of your competitors. You know, I know we've got um, uh, Parvi talking about Tony's in a moment, and there's also Divine and everybody will know about that. Um, and actually the interesting thing from my perspective is if you can get brands to come together around a central theme, actually you can do an awful lot of good. You might be competitors, um, but for three brands to give away, um, you know, over 32 million pounds uh, to fund clean water projects with slightly different models, I think is, is incredible. And whilst there will always be healthy competition, I think learning from your peers is, is really important as to how you do that. So we're really proud of what we do uh, and we think that's a great, a, a great success. As I said, over time, the range has expanded. So with the advent of uh, you know, new materials and different packaging formats, we've moved into things like Tetra Pak for water, which has got the lowest carbon footprint of any package container out there into uh, cans, which are made of 68% recycled aluminium. Um, recently this year, um, we've launched um, a very new innovative product, which is 100% recycled aluminium pre-filled with British spring water uh, bottle or flask, um, which is starting to, to prove to be really successful. And again, very low carbon footprint on that and obviously refillables and point of view systems as well. Um, so there's, there's a lot that we do in this space. Uh, we talk to a lot of people. We've got over a quarter of a million followers on social media. Um, we like to work with other B Corps and, and other partners to, to share those kind of messages. Um, and we'll continue to do that. Um, I think the thing for me that encapsulates a lot of what we do really is th these three pictures. So the one on the left is the one that um, got me to, to really start this to begin with. There was a photograph taken of a, a young girl in Kibera in Nairobi, um, which said that there were four taps for about half a million people in, in that particular informal settlement. Um, and that was the thing that really prompted me to say, well, is there something that we can do about that? And this is what led to the creation of, of uh, one water um, and if you if you want to look up on YouTube searching for the Kibera girl um, it's actually a film about how we went and found her 10 years after we first started which is, is, a, is an amazing story everybody knows Greta Thunberg and David Attenborough and their perspectives um, and as I said we've been doing a lot of this uh, in, in the background for a number of years um, so I think as Paul was saying B Corp doesn't just look about you know how you generate money, but it's about how you behave as a business. And that's really what I think is the basis of, of all B Corp behaviors. Um, one of the things that we're really honest about is that we, we are, we call ourselves packaging agnostic. We don't talk about being pro, pro water and plastic bottles or pro cans. We actually give everybody the, the information that says, well, we'll let you make informed choices about what's good and bad. So if you want a product that's more recycled, you could go for this one. If you want one that's lower carbon, you can go for that one. Um, and it's quite interesting. You get the sort of knee jerk reaction sometimes to water and plastic bottles without people necessarily understanding that it's one of the easiest products to recycle. There's a great supply chain for recycling. There's great demand there for the material as well. Um, and, and that constantly improves. So there are a lot of things uh, in that sort of space that we can share with people. Um, talking a little bit about B Corp in the context of other schemes. So we subscribe to all of these. The One Foundation is the recipient of all the money that we generate, and that's um, how we spend it. We're also uh, uh, the winner of the largest social enterprise in the UK award. Um, uh, we're also a carbon neutral company. We're members of the SRA. We're signatories to the UN Global Compact. We subscribe to the SDGs, B Corp. Uh, signatory to the new plastics economy and a 1% for the planet uh, participant as well. All of these schemes you can access for little or no money. 
um, and as I was saying to Rosa when she first asked me to talk about this, is that the only one that has real teeth, in my opinion, is B Corp. And B Corp is the one that I hate the most um, because it is the most rigorous and you will spend days going through all of their assessments and then you'll get their lawyers phone you up and probe you uh, incessantly to prove everything that you're saying. And so B Corp is the one, if you're going to be really serious about this, um, B Corp is, is the way to go. Uh, just a couple of slides that I put in to give you a sort of sense of um, what it looks like. So you get a, a typical dashboard, it gives you lots of areas that you're supposed to review, gives you direction as to what you're supposed to be doing next when your completion dates are and, and things like that. And it is, it is very rigorous. It's a mix of a lot of Excel tables, uh, as well as a lot of online, uh, uh, online funding as well. Um, as Paul was saying, it, they continually lift the bar, which frankly, from a personal perspective, is a bit of a nightmare. So when we first started uh, back in 2015, 16, um, we were rated as one of the best in the world. And we held that accolade for 2016, 17 and 2019. Not quite sure what happened in 2018. Um, but our score actually has decreased every year. Um, so in, uh, in 2015, we were 104. Um, in 2020, it's saying 102. Uh, in last year, it was actually 79. And the, the 102 score for this year, I know will get chipped away again when the, lawyers, uh, when the lawyers come into that. The reason for that is that actually, collectively, they decided to go after... Uh, bottled water companies specifically, but more in the context of anybody in packaging that is they consider to be a problem. So I have this continual tension with them about why are you penalising us um, when we're doing all these kind of other things. So it's it's a challenge, but do, as Paul said, expect when you sign up that you will be pushed harder and harder and harder as you go forward. Um, Having said that, there are lots of fantastic benefits to being a B Corp, not least all of the other B Corps that you get to play with um, and get to collaborate with. So there's a lot of uh, picking up the phone, talking to people saying, we'd like to do this and, and, and we'd like to do it with you. And that seems to be a fantastic uh, way to, to, to do things. Lastly, um, what's next? Uh, if anybody doesn't know about scope three emissions and science-based targets, that's what I would look at. Um, because I think, as Paul was saying, the world is going uh, to, to net zero position. And if you're going to do anything, I think that's really where you need to focus is, is looking at that. Um, we have a whole host of things that we're doing around this sort of space. Um, and it becomes a bit of a full time job, really, for, for looking at all the environmental footprints. Uh, all of your uh, different scopes, uh, emissions, and also the cost of what you do about those things as well. So it's a, it's a big journey. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Duncan, for sharing the journey of one with us, with us um, taking us through the packaging evolution and helping us understand that B Corp has teeth. <laughs> Um, we're now going to um, hear from Pavi. Pavi is Impact Navigator at Tony's Chocolonely. Um, she's responsible for measuring and validating Tony's impact on the ground and finding ways to raise the bar. Um, she believes that financial success and sustainable business practices go together like sea salt and caramel, which is also her favorite Tony's chocolate. So over to you, Pavi. You just need to find your unmute button. Yeah. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for organizing this, Rose. And uh, thank you so much for Paul and uh, to Paul and Duncan as well. I think um, we, we all are going to have the same messages, different sectors, different industries, same messages, same, um, same values. So, so that's great. Uh, but yes, my name is Pavi, and like Rose said, I'm the impact navigator at Tony's Chocolate Only. Tony's is an impact company that makes chocolate, not the other way around. Uh, we've been a B Corp since 2013 as the first European chocolate company and second company in the Netherlands to be B Corp certified. And even though Rose asked me to talk about what we do as a B Corp and how we do things, um, I'd first like to talk about why. Because even though chocolate should be a treat for everyone, um, unfortunately it is not. 
because there's a very bitter reality behind chocolate. So let me give you a little background on the cocoa value chain. On the one hand, there are millions of smallholder farms that grow cocoa. Um, cocoa does not grow in big plantations. And on the other hand of that value chain, there are billions of chocolate consumers, like probably all of us on this call. Um, but in the middle, there is only a handful of big chocolate companies that actually produce um, the chocolate from these cocoa beans. So maybe about 10 big chocolate companies that produce around 90% um, of all the chocolate in the world. And it's in their interest to keep the prices of cocoa low, too low, inhumanely low. So this results in these millions of farmers at the beginning of the cocoa value chain, um, it results in them living in poverty. So um, cocoa mostly grows around the equator, but um, most of the cocoa nowadays is grown in Ghana and in Ivory Coast. So about 60% of the world's cocoa is grown in these two countries in about 2.5 million small farms. So these are small farms, family owned businesses. And on these 2.5 million smallholder farms, there are 1.56 million children engaged in child labor. So this is not child work. This is not children who come back home from school and help their mom and dad out on the farm. This is 1.56 million children who are engaged in illegal child labor that's as defined not just by the ILO, but also it's illegal according to their national laws. 95% of these children are engaged in hazardous child labor. So they're children, small children handling machetes, um, working with chemicals. And about 30,000 of these, um, so this, this 1.56 million uh, children engaged in child labor does not include the 30,000 people, children and adults who are what we call modern slaves. So they are in forced labor, which means they do unpaid work. Um, they've been trafficked. So this is the reality of the cocoa sector on the producer side of things. These forms of social abuses in the, in the cocoa sector are a direct result of the extreme poverty in which cocoa farmers live in. So this value chain, as we've just heard, is not equally divided. It is unequally divided. Also why our Tony's chocolate bars are unequally divided because if the cocoa sector is not equal, why should the bars be? Uh, so based on this in 2005, there was a Dutch journalist who was, uh, who was investigating for a TV show and he was shocked when he found out that there was modern slavery and child labor on cocoa farms especially given that in 2001, many chocolate companies had signed the Hawk and Engel protocol, promising to eliminate child labor in their supply chains. But nothing had happened in 2005 when um, the Dutch journalist Turn van der Koken was looking at it. So he decided then to um, try and interview other chocolate companies to ask them you know, what their stance was. Obviously it was for a TV show, no chocolate company wanted to talk to him. So what Turn did was he, um, on television, he ate a whole lot of chocolate that he was sure had ch child labor in the supply chain. So that made him complicit to slavery. Um, and he turned himself in as a chocolate criminal. Now, well, he wasn't prosecuted even though there were reasons to, uh, but the outcome of this was Turn decided to make his own chocolate bar. So he produced like 5,000 fair trade chocolate bars to, to try and uh, lead by example. And uh, that's how Tony's Chocolate Lonely was born. So Tony, the international name for Turn, and Chocolate Lonely, his lonely fight in the, in the chocolate sector. So the small company was born with a big mission, together we'll make chocolate 100% slave free. So how do we go about working towards this big mission? We have a very simple roadmap. It's a three-pronged approach. 
uh, we say Tony's creates awareness. That's because we convinced that when consumers and retailers simply ask more questions about what they're putting in their shopping baskets, what they're putting on their shelves, um, then they can start demanding from chocolate producers um, to, for, for fair chocolate. So there's more pressure on chocolate companies to take responsibility for their supply chains. And then of course, now we've um, talked the talk, but how do we actually walk the talk? So we lead by example. So we have something that we call the five sourcing principles. So we make chocolate from fully traceable cocoa beans that we buy directly from cooperatives in Ghana and in Ivory Coast. We pay a higher price for the cocoa beans so farmers can reach a living income. We invest in long-term relationships with these cocoa farmers and we train, the, we train them to increase their efficiency to help them organize themselves. And finally, Tony's inspires to act. So the last um, and possibly the most important uh, uh, pillar in our roadmap at the moment, Tony's inspires to act because we want to inspire others to also take action and we welcome anyone to follow us, copy us, or even improve our business model. So we say that our USP is that we don't want to be unique. We, we want people to join us in our mission. We want people to, uh, to do business the way we do. Uh, so we have something called the Tony's Open Chain, which is a collaborative initiative uh, where we invite other chocolate companies and um, retailers that produce their own chocolate to join us because we believe that competition should be on the chocolate, not on the cocoa. So let's not, let's not compete on the cocoa and how much we pay the farmers and how we do business. Uh, let's compete on our chocolate. Let's compete on our flavors. Um, so we had a couple of years ago, Albert Hein, which is the largest retailer in the Netherlands. They joined the open chain with uh, their Delicata brand. And this year, which is just, we just announced it in our annual fair and our fair report that was released last week. We have Aldi joining in as an open chain mission ally as well. So it's great to see other businesses that uh, to, to, that join in on our mission and uh, that want to do business the way we do business, which, which we believe is, is, truly, is, is a way to make a difference in the cocoa sector. So this is how we believe that how a small chocolate company, well, we're not, no longer that small, but how a company can make a big difference in the world because we need everyone to join in because on our own, we can make our chocolate slave free, but only together with farmers, with retailers, with chocolate fans, with governments, and with the rest of the industry, can we make all chocolate 100% slave free. Uh, our CEO, Henkian Beltman says, why should businesses who do good be labeled social enterprises? Why is that a term? All businesses should be social enterprises and those that are not should be asocial. So that should be a thing, but social enterprises should be a norm and which leads us to B Corp because this is, this is why we became B Corp certified in, 2000, um, in 2013. Uh, the B Corp mission al was aligned with our own uh, we, you know, B Corps want companies to be holistically good. So money is always a means to an end, not the end in itself. Uh, as Duncan just mentioned as well, they, they are very rigorous in the way they look at um, what it takes to be a B Corp. And they really look at different angles. So the social aspect, the environmental aspect, governance. Um, so being, so the B Corp ideals were really aligned with uh, the Tony's ideals. And uh, again, we do not believe that certification is the end. It should, it's just a step towards a larger mission. So um, echoing Duncan, yes, uh, our scores also, when we first became B Corp certified, we had a very high score of 113 point something. Uh, the last time we got certified, uh, our scores dropped and we were able to see exactly in which areas our scores dropped. And the great thing about the B impact assessment is that it, it really shows you uh, where you need to improve and how you can raise the bar. Of course, the fact that each with each certification round, it gets harder and more rigorous, but that only means that, you know, we, you can be sure that if you've checked, if, if you do meet all those criteria, then you've truly earned the certification. So, um, so that's there. 
Um, Rose asked me to um, share a little bit on what the ideal next step should be for anyone who is exploring, uh, wanting to be uh, become a B Corp. There is the B Impact Assessment that you can actually access for free online. So to kind of give you a bit of a sense of what, what actually this whole questionnaire is about. It is hard, it is long, um, but I think it is worth it. It will help you realize a lot on, um, you know, where, where, where you're doing good and where you can improve. Um, and also the B Corp has uh, something called the SDG Action Manager. So um, I think both Paul and Duncan talked about the SDGs and um, companies needing to be aligned with the SDGs. Of course, with Tony's, it's a little bit different because we the way the company was founded was very much already mission driven. So the impact came before the, the chocolate. Um, so we, we knew which SDGs we were working on, but the SDG Action Manager actually helps also um, companies uh, def identify which are the key SDGs that they can and should work on. So like Rosé said, I truly believe that uh, financial success and doing business ethically do go hand in hand like sea salt and caramel. Um, so it is now's time to really change. Um, it's the new normal is the changed normal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pavi. And I actually do not know how to stop sharing my screen. So I think it's at the at the top there should be a stop share. Yes. And, yeah. Great. Perfect. Thank you very much, um, Pavi, for sharing Tony's journey with us, um, helping us understand the problem in the cocoa sector, um, and giving us your perspective on B Corp. And that leaves us nicely with ten minutes to um, ask questions. So. I wanted to open the floor to the first question. You're welcome to either write your questions in the chat and then I'll um, ask them to our speakers or you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask a question. So I wouldn't mind wanting to ask if possible. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? So Pavithra, uh, uh, fantastic presentation. I'm from a chocolate brand, uh, uh, called Jenny Wren Chocolates and Beaches Fine Chocolates. Um, we don't, um, we buy from Barry Calabau and it was really interesting to see they were part of the open chain. Can I ask a few more questions? I'm sorry, this is so chocolate related, but um, can I ask what that exactly means and what have Barry Calabau done um, to sort of join that um, uh, kind of group? Of course. So Barry Calabau is, um, is where our couverture is made. And uh, the reason we actually decided to, when, when Tony's first started, the reason we uh, decided to partner with Barry Calabout is because we wanted, we wanted a big chocolate producer to uh, join in on the way we work to kind of show to the rest of the industry that uh, it is possible to segregate your beans and have traceable beans. It is possible to have that fully transparent supply chain. Uh, so, so that's 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 what Barry Calabout. Uh, that's that's our relationship with them. So they make our couverture. We have separate tanks at the Barry Calabout factory where our beans get segregated there. And Barry Calabout also produces chocolate for Albert Heinz Delicata. So even the open chain mission allies who join us, um, this so they kind of act like the enabler uh, for the whole open chain. That's amazing, thank you. Uh, we, uh, we buy their fair trade uh, cocoa, so they do our curvature as well. Um, I might uh, message you separately afterwards to ask Please exactly do, yeah. to make sure it's different and whether that's something we can uh, might need to look at and if, or would like to look at in the future because uh, that's really important to us. Thank you, everybody. Absolutely. You. I'll put my email address in the chat so you can get it from there. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah. We have a question in the chat. Um, I'll just read it out and maybe Paul, um, if you're happy, you can um, answer it. Uh, so the question is about greenwashing. So with the currency value of all the great work done by genuinely sustainable and socially environmentally proactive businesses um, being undermined by businesses engaged in greenwashing, um, where um, does the panel think this will lead? Paul, do you want to um, start? 
take that one. Yeah, uh, the, okay, so the facts is there will be greenwashing, there will be purpose washing. It's inevitable because consumers are way, way ahead of manufacturers and business. In fact, I saw some data the other day. Um, the consumers are buying sustainably or intend to buy sustainably is 79% of consumers in the UK. If you ask businesses the same question, how, how sustainable do you think your consumers are? They answer half that, which is, is quite interesting. But there is a bandwagon and people will jump on it. That's the facts of the matter. We can either get upset about it or we can trust that actually consumers are getting more savvy. They are becoming more sustainable. And I think they see through a lot of the, um, the green wash and purpose wash and will increasingly do so as time goes on. I mean, that's why we've chosen the two businesses to come onto this call because they are doing the kind of things, the radical transformation kind of things that all businesses need to do in the future. So rather than getting hung up on greenwash and purpose wash, it's an indication the world's changing in the right direction. Um, and yeah, let's not get too upset about it, but let's do what we can as companies to do exactly what we can to not, to not pull the wool over people's eyes and to do it properly. That would be my answer. I don't know, Duncan, if you want to add to that. Yeah, I, I would just kind of echo what uh, Paul's... <laughs> Sorry, that's my dog. He let the dogs out. <laughs> uh, she'll come back. He is upset about greenwash, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, uh, yeah, sorry, I was just going to say, one of the interesting things is that you won't get past a buyer if you're trying to sell in something and you're using fake data or you're making false claims, you know, buyers will sniff that out. And we had one instance quite recently where um, I won't name the, the manufacturer, but a manufacturer was talking to um, a national grocer and making certain claims and the grocer just turned around and said, you know, that's not true. And um, so I, th I think, you know, things like that tend to get found out. And we've also over the years been contacted by, um, regulatory bodies about competitors that be making certain claims. So I think with Paul, it will happen. Some of it takes care of itself and some of it you just have to ignore and just focus on what you're, you're really geared up to do. Thank you. Um, we have um, a next question that's asking, how long does it take to become a B Corp um, and what level of resource is required? Um, I don't mind who would like to start answering that question. Paul, yeah. Yeah, go on then. Um, the, how long is a piece of string, really? It, it's entirely dependent on the complexity of your business and how much data you've got access to quickly. Um, it is a lot of evidence. I think we, we're just in the same as uh, Duncan, we're just in the process of recertifying at the moment and we've submitted 187 pieces of evidence. And we're, in effect, we're quite a simple business. We're just moving boxes around, uh, a lot of them, but we are moving different boxes around. We Our certification will take a lot longer next time we do it because we will have a retail business and a, a restaurant then, which will add a lot of complexity and a lot more data to, to be gathered. So I think if you've got good data from start to finish, you can probably do it in three months. Uh, there is a lead time at the moment with, they've had, they've, there's more than one UK company certifying every day at the moment, 430 it was last Friday, it's probably 435 by now. Um, so there is a bit of a queue um, once you've got the evidence together in order for you to get the stamp but so that's probably another three months so six months in total i would say i just add to uh, something to add to that is that they they go through absolutely everything so whoever is doing the certification process needs access to all your hr all your financial data um everything so you need it really needs to be top down in, in terms of uh that, that's that approach and I, so we also up for our recertification and um, 
you know, apart from what Paul and Duncan already said, I think it would be helpful to have at least one person that's dedicated or who, who's the owner of the process, because uh, like they said, there's a lot of information to be gathered and uh, submitted. So it's good if then there's one person who is responsible for that. Okay. Great. Um, regarding your question, Barnes, about source for stats, um, I think I'll pick up with you um, offline if that's okay, but I, I will check with Paul and Duncan and see if I can send something through. Um, and then, ah, last question. Okay, let's take the last question that's just come into the chat and then I'm keen for us to finish um, on time. Um, are other certification schemes complementary to the B Corp process? or are there differences um, that may need to be managed? Um, for example, uh, fair trade and cocoa. Um, Pavi, do you want to start because it includes the fair trade question? Uh, yes, I can. So I think for me, so we are fair trade certified as well. And for me, a big difference uh, between the fair trade and B Corp side of things is uh, fair trade really focuses on the, on the producer end. So really like how, on the farmer, um, on the farmer side of things, so like how how we work with the cooperatives, um, the premiums paid. While with B Corp, it really looks through the entire supply chain and also the responsibility of the company in the supply chain. So, uh, with fair trade as well, I think the the, the similarities would be that um, you know we we go through a recertification process with both certifications. There is an audit um, that is that is done, so there's still paperwork. And uh, but but with B Corp, it's it's really more reporting by the company. While with fair trade, um, it also looks into uh, the 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 farmer side of things. So the producer side of things. Paul or Duncan, is, do you have anything to add from your side? Um, I, I, I would just say there's a lot of commonality between different schemes, but unfortunately they don't all dovetail together. Um, if anybody is a member of the Consumer Goods Forum, um, the SSCI, uh, um, uh, program is, is trying to look at how do they start to collaborate across a lot of these different certifications to avoid replication. Um, but at the moment, you you know, one set of financial data is the same, but people may ask for it in different ways. So you you sometimes do have to reinvent the wheel a bit. My one of my closest friends was the head of fair trade in Germany. Uh, he left because he didn't think the bar was high enough. That's all I'll say on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think fair trade had an opportunity to, to do, they were obviously very early in, very pioneering, but could have done a lot more and haven't, is my view on fair trade. And this is, so there's this, um, I can't remember whose quote it was, but it's that, you know, if you're a hammer, then everything looks like a, a nail. And then with fair trade, the thing was, you know, it's that it's the chain of custody versus, um, you know, the compliance on the whole um, on the whole supply chain. And because they they were so producer focused that they where where the problem the solution actually lies in the companies and industry stepping up and taking responsibility. But because they were so focused on the farmers that all the solutions also kind of lie um, in in the producing countries. Uh, which is, I think, where they miss their mark a bit in holding companies accountable for what they need to be doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to um, wrap this up now um, and just wanted to say a big thank you to Duncan, Pavi and Paul um, for joining, for, for speaking here today. Um, and thank you very much to all of you for joining this webinar. If there are any questions that um, you still have, feel free to get in touch um, either with our speakers or with myself. Um, and I wish you all a great rest of the day. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.